Good afternoon or good morning to everyone who is joining us, depending on your time zone. Um, we're going to let people join, uh, continue to join. So um, I'm just going to wait just a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll get started in just a minute or two. Okay, for I'm going to go ahead and start um, with some housekeeping uh, while other people are joining us. And thank you again for joining us. Um, all registrants are in mute at the moment, except for the panelists. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have questions, you can type them at any time into the chat box and we will get those questions at the end. If you don't see the if you don't see the chat box or you're not sure where to submit a question, um, you can you might have to pull the little orange arrow that's in the upper right hand corner of your screen and then the chat box should appear and you can type your questions in. We also are recording the webinar. So you will be able to access the information afterwards and pass it on to others. And also, if you missed it or if you know people who uh, were not able to sign up, they should be able to get to that webinar. We will most likely have the webinar up, a uh, recording up this afternoon. But otherwise, we will have it up tomorrow. And for those not familiar with SSTI, uh, well, first I, sh I suppose I should uh, tell you who you're going to be hearing from today. Uh, Chris McCahill will be presenting first. He is a senior associate at SSTI, the State Smart Transportation Initiative. He's been with us since uh, 2013. Is that right, Chris, 2013? That sounds right, yeah. <laughs> okay. He has a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Connecticut. And prior to joining SSTI, Chris worked on the Project for Transportation Reform at the Congress for the New Urbanism. And he's been the principal person who has been working with uh, Virginia on this project. Uh, after Chris, we will be hearing from Keith Jasper, who is the program coordinator with the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. Uh, known as NVTA. NVTA is responsible for developing and updating Northern Virginia's long-range transportation plan known as TransAction and Keith is NVTA's project manager for that effort. He is also NVTA's data-driven, uh, also leads NVTA's data-driven program programming activities and has coordinated the development and application of NVTA's project selection process using data from multiple sources. So he'll be talking a little bit about um, how they're going to be using the information that we've developed for them. And for those not familiar with SSTI, we are a network of reform-minded state DOTs. We are at the University of Wisconsin, and we uh, work in three different ways. We work at the executive level of, uh, as a community of practice, trading ideas among the CEOs of the states that we work with. And uh, we also do technical assistance for some of those states. And then finally, we are a resource for the general transportation community, which is where the webinars such as these come in. And again, for anyone who joined us a little late, uh, we will be taking questions at the end. And you can type questions into the chat box. You may need to pull the little orange arrow in the upper left-hand corner of your screen to access the chat box. And I'm going to go ahead and give Chris the uh, keyboard and mouse. And he can take the uh, 
presentation from here. Okay, uh, thanks, Robbie, and thanks for uh, everyone who's joining us today. Muted. Uh, this has a, been a really neat project, um, um, so we're happy to uh, to share what came out of it um, and uh, give a little peek into what we think is possible with this big data big data applications um, and where we think it could be headed. Um, project kicked off, I think, about a year ago, right now, um, and wrapped up in March. Um, although we have uh, an ongoing relationship with folks at the Virginia DOT um, and uh, other stakeholders in the region, such as the NVTA, to uh, keep working with them um, and uh, move the use of data forward uh, in the state. So just a, uh, the, the goal of this project was um, to use big data, uh, and what we'll be talking about is actually GPS uh, location data, uh, to explore ways to improve access to destinations in Northern Virginia. Um, and we're talking about um, sort of uh, small, small things that can be done to improve access, like uh, traditional transportation demand management, um, connectivity solutions, uh, street connectivity, and modal connectivity first and last mile solutions uh, to transit stations, um, design uh, implementation, so um, uh, for example, changing street design, uh, that includes uh, adding bike and pedestrian facilities and things like that. Uh, land use applications, um, so uh, where uh, you know dense compact development could help improve access, um, and parking and parking management. So basically, we are looking at anything except major highway and transit capacity projects. Um, like I said, sort of the small wins. Uh, and the team on this project was the Virginia Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment um, with us, SSTI. Uh, we also had help from folks at Michael Baker International. Uh, they were our feet on the ground in Virginia for a large part of the project. Um, and Streetlight Data, uh, which is a company based in San Francisco uh, that provided us the GPS data. Um, so before we really launched into this project, um, we, we convened a few meetings with folks in Northern Virginia uh, to find out what kind of initiatives they were already engaging in, um, mostly focused on transportation demand management and things affiliated with, with TDM. Uh, and we reviewed um, everything that, was, that uh, stakeholders said that they were working on in the region, um, and this is sort of a breakdown of, of where their efforts lie. So you can see um, a, a lot of focus in educational programs and events, uh, so you know, promoting ideas like, like carpooling and promoting transit and any sort of information sharing um, and special events. Um, all the way down the list um, to things at the very bottom like parking management, um, pay as you drive, uh, insurance, things like that. Uh, and looking through the literature, this breakdown is, is pretty typical. Um, the, the types of things that, folk, that people put their energy first um, compared to the things that, that uh, aren't getting as much attention. And what we were hoping is that by introducing this new data and new information, uh, we could sort of um, bring to the surface new opportunities. Um, and I'm just highlighting a few here that, that we looked at in the study. Things like um, improving access to transit stations, so first and last mile connections, um, road and path connectivity, uh, including bike and ped connectivity. Um, then towards the bottom, things that aren't looked at quite as often as much at all, transit-oriented development uh, opportunities, uh, and parking management and pricing. So that was just to give us some insight heading into the project is where the region already stood. The data that we're working with uh, is anonymous GPS data from mobile phones and nav navigational devices. Um, the company that we worked with, Streetlight Data, works with different uh, uh, um, uh, providers of navigational services and uh, mobile phone apps, um, all of which collect uh, GPS data. Uh, uh, they work to, to sort of aggregate that data and, uh, and archive it and analyze it. Um, so this is a, what we're, we're working with a smaller sample but higher precision than cellular data. So the figure here, um, you can see the small greenish dots. These are all uh, GPS pings. Um, and you can see how they're sort of um, collected along the, the roads and streets. Um, you can see the bigger purple circles uh, in the, the background. Those would be sort of, those represent your sort of typical uh, cellular, cellular location data. So um, it's a little more coarse because the cellular location isn't as accurate. Um, so we're talking about much more precise information. Um, and there's less of it 
uh, because um, there's fewer of these GPS devices than there are cell phones. But um, the sample size is actually growing pretty quickly, uh, and we're seeing a really uh, robust uh, number of pings. <clears throat> Uh, and the benefit of this is that it, it adds information compared to maybe traffic counts or travel demand models. So with a traffic count, you can see how many vehicles are passing a certain point on the road. Uh, but with the GPS information, you can uh, trace those and find out uh, where folks were starting and ending their trip uh, and what routes they took along the way. Um, travel demand models can do a similar thing, but in many cases, what we're seeing is a much higher resolution uh, than the travel demand might capture. Cause we're seeing a lot of activity within small areas. Uh, and as become clear in the presentation, uh, a lot of what we looked at was short trips. So trips uh, that are only a mile long or two miles long. Uh, and uh, travel demand models aren't great at capturing that kind of activity, even though they make up, uh, as you'll see, a really large number of the trips in the region. Uh, this is just sort of an overview of what you can do with the GPS data uh, in general. Uh, let's say you want to um, analyze uh, precise origins and demographic information. So you can see where trips started. Uh, and by knowing where a trip started, you can attach certain demographic information to it. Um, so if you know the sort of home location of a, of a, of a trace, um, then you can um, understand you know, income breakdown of people traveling from that location, um, attach those attributes to, to the trips. Uh, you can do, um, so you can do equity analysis and uh, things like that. Uh, we have precise destination and time, day, uh, time uh, and day of the week information. So um, we can see where trips are going, uh, where they started, uh, and look at the different times of day. So we can see where trips were going in the AM period compared to the PM period or uh, in the middle of the day. We can see actual routes uh, and trip duration. So we can track these traces uh, over time and see, uh, as you can see in the picture here, uh, this is showing uh, how a majority of the folks traveling from the area, uh, the zone in the bottom to the to the to into the city, uh, took the the western path. Um, but you can see the percent of folks that that took that eastern path instead. So we can do uh, sort of a, a route breakdown. Um, we can break out uh, certain types of uh, vehicles. So uh, personal vehicles are are um, a explicitly separate group from commercial vehicles. So we could do. Um, uh, an analysis that was specific to only the commercial vehicles or freight, um, or vice versa, um, only the personal vehicles. And we can also do custom date ranges. So you could um, look at a certain area um, for a month at the beginning of the year and a month at the end of the year uh, and see how things changed. You could do a before and after study uh, if you implemented a project um, or a new program. Uh, the routes that you're seeing here aren't what we see. Um, we don't see this level of detail when we get the data from from streetlight data, um, we see patterns. We see general origin destination flows. Um, and we can look at a certain route and see uh, where folks started and ended their trip uh, if, they if they traveled on a certain route. And you'll see some examples of that. So for this project, um, what we did was first we took the this, uh, GPS data, which was um, four months out of the, of the year two, 2015, um, four months scattered throughout the year. Uh, and we scanned that data um, for three things. Short trips, uh, as I mentioned, so trips under five miles, under two miles, and under one mile. Circuitous trips, uh, and circuity would be defined as the um, how, how long, uh, how, how far a person actually traveled to get from their origin to their destination, uh, divided by the straight line distance. So how far out of their way are people going, um, which could tell us things about poor network connectivity, uh, or people avoiding a certain route because of maybe traffic congestion or some other condition, uh, and common origin destination pairs. So anywhere where lots of people are going from one place to another place, uh, which would suggest opportunities for carpooling or transit um, or some other initiative like that. We then uh, identified um, case studies to highlight uh, issues that we observed and the opportunities that they, that they suggest. Um, and we did 17 case studies in the end, and I'll show you a sample of those here. Uh, then for each of the case studies, we evaluated the costs and benefits of ended actions. Uh, and we actually used the GPS data to do our, our estimates of benefits, um, which is something that this work adds that might not have been possible before. We were really engaged with the stakeholders throughout the process. Uh, we had several meetings with them um, at, at different points in time, showed them how far we'd gotten, asked them questions about what sort of information would be useful for them, um, and did our best to provide that information. A lot of the, what came out of this was um, 
that folks had specific requests for certain types of data. So um, they were in, interested in flows along a certain corridor or to certain park and rides. Um, so we worked with, with stakeholders to provide data. And uh, as you'll see, we worked with uh, NBTA quite a bit to, tr to try and help uh, get them some stuff that would help in their programming efforts. This is just a sample of what our scan looks like. Um, and uh, this is in table form. It's not mapped. Uh, but this is showing um, common OD pairs. So we ranked uh, origin destination pairs uh, based on how much flow there was between the two pairs. Um, so we could see flows that had the highest number of, uh, the pairs that had the highest number of flows, um, upwards of several thousand trips per day. Um, we could also see the circuity for that flow. Um, so you see certain OD pairs jump out where we can tell that people are, are going a bit more out of their way to travel between those two zones. Uh, we can tell the distance, the total distance that folks are traveling uh, between the two zones, and the duration, the amount of time that it's taken. Um, so you can see some cases where uh, folks are traveling quite a bit of time to travel a fairly short distance, uh, which might indicate um, traffic congestion or something else that's slowing them down along the way. Um, and those might be an instance where we want to check it out and uh, uh, see if there's uh, an opportunity to fix that. Uh, we estimated total VMT for all the, the trips that are going, uh, vehicle miles traveled for all the trips that are going between the two pairs, and vehicle hours traveled. Uh, so we could see um, which, which uh, OD pairs maybe uh, targeting them with some sort of solution would have the biggest impact. Uh, we also scanned for short and circuitous trips. Um, so this is showing short circuitous trips combined. Um, between any OD pair. A lot of these you might notice are um, the, the origin pair and the destination, or the origin TAS and the destination TAS are the same. That means that the trip both started and it ended in that zone. So we, we saw a lot of this, where um, a lot of folks were uh, driving um, short trips within the zone. And this is the kind of thing that might not appear in a travel demand model. But the numbers are really high. Uh, I'll just note here, um, since I don't think I mentioned it, that we're talking only about vehicle trips here. So we know that these are all vehicle trips. Um, finally, we also did uh, select link analyses. So this is where we picked certain segments of the road. Um, these might have been roads that were particularly congested um, or roads that um, were programmed for um, improvements um, where major projects were happening uh, or roads that um, stakeholders pointed out, us, pointed out and had specific questions about. What we did is we looked at all the flow that was passing through that piece of that selected link, through that piece of road, and gathered a bunch of information about it so we could see uh, how many uh, vehicles are traveling along it. Um, uh, we could see, so the first column after that is top OD pair. So that's how much flow uh, along that link is attributed, attributed to a single origin destination pair, right? Um, in that case, um, that might be a way uh, you might want to target uh, that for something to, to get those folks off of that route, right? So if 10% uh, of the um, trips are on a single OD pair, then maybe a transit line uh, could between those two places could get folks off of the road. Now we also looked at the, the contribution from the top five pairs, uh, because sometimes we saw that um, folks might be heading from zone A to zone B, and then from zone A to zone C, and B and C are right next to each other, right? So those are kind of still really similar flows. They might be opportunities for the same sort of transit, but they didn't uh, come out in, the, in just looking at the top uh, pair. So we looked at how much was due to just the top five pairs. We also looked at um, what percent of the trips were under five miles, under two miles, under one mile, see if we could get short trips off of the road, because we know that getting just uh, five or 10% of trips off of a congested route uh, could be the difference between uh, that, that road operating at a, a failing service or um, or uh, operating at a, a, a much closer to free flow speed. So we scanned the data. Um, we looked for um, things that jumped out. Uh, either they had lots of short trips or they had um, especially circuitous flow um, or any combination of those things. Um, we came up with a list. We took the list back to stakeholders. Um, got their feedback, and uh, then started digging into each one um, and developing case studies for each of them. Uh, and we're going to show, I think, four of them here. 
And you know, they're all over the region, um, different geographic locations, different types of issues. Uh, so that we, we were mainly interested in highlighting uh, how, how, how to use the data. Um, the first uh, case study is Tyson's Corner. Uh, this is one that jumped out in the data just about every way it could. Lots of short trips, um, lots of circuity, uh, lots of internal trips, um, and the, the traffic contributed to quite a bit to congestion on the nearby routes. Uh, what this map is showing is how many trips um, starting or ending in Tyson's Corner, which is that yellow area, um, started or ended in some other location. Uh, so the, you can see there's 36,000 trips um, that start and end in Tyson Corner. So throughout the day, you know, 36,000 trips, uh, vehicle trips, are just driving around in Tyson's Corner. Um, and that's a big indication um, that uh, things could be done there to improve um, alternatives to getting around within Tyson's Corner. Uh, there's a new um, silver line that runs through Tyson's Corner, um, but it was built sort of in a more suburban form, so it's not especially walkable and bikeable at this point. Um, so what we took away from this was that by by improving those things and uh, reducing the number of people that need to drive, feel like they need to drive around uh, within Tyson's Corner during the day, uh, could make it um, make commuting by transit to Tyson's Corner a more appealing option. Uh, you can also see how many folks are traveling to areas around Tyson's Corner. Um, thousands, uh, thousands of trips um, to zones all within about two or three miles, um, including trips along the new Silver Line uh, and other nearby transit lines. So a lot of opportunity to convert some of these vehicle trips to um, to other modes uh, and uh, and open up some capacity on the roads. Uh, this is a select link analysis. Uh, I don't want to go into this too much because I think Keith's going to talk about it a little bit also, but we can look at, uh, in this case, traffic on um, Route 7 westbound, which is in the yellow dot there, uh, and we can see how much of it um, began in Tyson's Corner, which would be the uh, any, uh, trips are starting in the areas in green, um, and where the trips on that road ended. Uh, and you can see so those are the red zones scattered throughout the region um, with some hot spots of activity. Um, and what we can see is that about 29% of the traffic on Route 7 westbound during the PM period um, begins in Tyson's. Uh, so that's a significant impact of the traffic there. 22% of the trips on the road are under 5 miles, 16% are under 2 miles, and 7% are under 1 mile. So this is really useful information. We might not be able to get out of the way. <clears throat> So we looked at uh, Tyson's, um, suggested some, some uh, opportunities to, to make improvements. Um, nothing new here. There's a lot of work being done in the area. There's uh, lots of plans in place. Um, but our data sort of bolsters some of the efforts there. Uh, so opportunities include bike and ped improvements, parking management, uh, street and parcel connections uh, to make walking and biking more direct and more friendly, uh, and other local transportation options such as circulator shovels, uh, shuttles and uh, delivery services. Uh, using the data, we worked with the folks at, at Michael Baker International to come up with um, estimates of benefits and costs of, of implementing some of these recommend recommendations. And these are very sketch level estimates, but they gave us a sense of how the different projects compared. Um, the benefits of this one is to enable walkable transit-oriented development. Uh, looking at the data, we made some pretty modest assumptions about you know, how many um, short trips uh, we could realistically remove from the system by making some of these improvements. And we are looking at on the order of you know, 5 or 10% of, of short trips, like trips under one mile. Um, and we saw really significant impacts that we could remove potentially 2 to 4 million vehicle trips per year. Um, that's eliminating up to a million hours of travel. Uh, save up to 11.5 million in traveler costs per year. That's just direct traveler costs to those trips that we uh, considered uh, removing. Uh, and eliminate up to 8,400 tons of carbon emissions through uh, re getting rid of those trips by switching modes. Um, cost to implement this, uh, 12 to 14 million in capital, um, including 3 million for transit and 9 to 10 million for road and bike and pedestrian improvements, 1.8 million in annual operating costs for transit and TDM programs. Uh, and we did these calculations for every case study. I won't go through them all, though. Uh, another interesting example that jumped out was George Mason University. Uh, and this one was interesting because it wasn't really on anyone's radar that we talked to in the region. Um, 
George Mason thought of as, as sort of a commuter campus in the region, uh, so lots of people traveling um, you know, everywhere throughout Northern Virginia. But we did see a concentration of trips right around the, the university. Um, you can see there's a, uh, about 1,000 trips just in the, the campus area. And 33% of all trips um, started or ended in this zone um, within uh, about three miles of campus. Uh, and for a, a, a college area, this is a pretty realistic um, radius to implement things like um, sh uh, better shuttle service um, and better uh, bike and ped connections um, and uh, get a lot of these folks that are driving in the near vicinity um, off the road and into other modes. Um, I'll add that we, we can also break this down by time of day. Um, we can look at where trips are going during the AM period or during the PM period, where they're starting, where they're ending. Uh, we can also break it out by income, so we can look at low-income people versus versus the general population. Uh, I just haven't shown any of that here. Uh, looking at George Mason, we found that um, the university has actually done a lot to improve uh, accessibility and connectivity on campus, um, but hasn't really reached beyond the borders of the campus. So a lot of uh, parking, large parking lots and garages have, have sort of popped up around the edges. Um, so that becomes the, the sort of main access point of these parking garages. Um, and a lot more could be done to connect the campus to its surrounding communities. Um, we can see that people are, are self-selecting to live there uh, and that a lot of people are traveling uh, in the immediate area during the day. Um, so a lot of those trips could be replaced, um, we think, by walking and biking, uh, managing the parking, um, perhaps um, pricing it a little more aggressively, um, and encouraging those mode shifts. Uh, we estimate that we could that uh, this, these actions could rem remove uh, 250 to 460,000 vehicle tri trips per year, and again, those are mostly just the short trips, um, uh, some small portion of those short trips. Uh, another interesting one was the Van Doren Street Metro Station. So the stations in the, the spot in the in the, the area in the yellow, um, and what we saw was uh, several thousand trips. Um, that were uh, beginning and ending in the neighborhood just to the north. Uh, this is a, less than a mile away, so it's, it's uh, immediately adjacent to the station. Um, these were uh, many vehicle trips, and they were also pretty circuitous trips. Uh, what's going on here is there's actually a, a freight rail line and a, a little brook um, that separates the station from those neighborhoods and, and creates a connectivity issue. Uh, this is something that VDOT has looked into. Um, uh, as we saw in this uh, accessibility study. Um, so it's not new, um, but we uh, basically have the data to show, to quantify the impact, right? So we're talking several thousand folks that are traveling uh, just across this, this poor connection. Uh, and most of them, we can tell from the data, are traveling on South Van Dorn Street there, just to the west of the station. Um, it's pretty much the only access point from the north to the south. Uh, this is what Van Dorn Street looks like. Uh, so we know that it's not especially friendly to bike and pedestrians, um, so definitely uh, uh, a disincentive for, for folks to, uh, to make that trip by, by a way other than driving. We looked into the possibility of um, adding a connection um, between the two neighborhoods. Uh, there are concerns, talking with the stakeholders, there are concerns about some, a connection like this adding uh, local traffic to the neighborhood to the north. Um, but we think there are ways around that by making this either uh, a limited uh, access crossing for bikes and pedestrians, or maybe just certain types of vehicles, maybe um, taxis uh, and commercial vehicles, or making it uh, a one-way connection. Um, by doing so, um, we think that uh, this could remove about 1,000, uh, 100,000 to 150,000 vehicle trips per year. Uh, and of course, that all the other uh, benefits that go along with that, um, reducing, BMT, uh, reducing uh, hours of travel and uh, greenhouse gas emissions and um, traveler costs. The last example um, is somewhat similar. This is the Ripon uh, VRE station. V uh, VRE is a commuter rail. Uh, and the station's in, in the yellow area um, there. The, it's the dot in the yellow area. We saw, again, um, several thousand trips uh, going to uh, neighborhoods just about a mile away, um, and uh, a couple hundred trips um, to the neighborhoods um, just adjacent to the station. Um, we think that this is a sign um, for opportunities to, to improve bike and pedestrian connections to the station, and also bike accommodations at the station. So, so things like um, better bike racks, bike storage, um, perhaps even a bike, bike share program. 
um, which are all sort of lacking. <clears throat> we also think that, um, so the, the yellow lines here are the two main access roads, uh, like the one I showed before, um, where, which would be prime candidates for improving bike facilities. Uh, but we also saw that there's a lot of um, missed opportunities to connect the local streets in the neighborhood um, just to the northeast. Um, and this wouldn't necessarily have to be uh, street connections um, because uh, residents tend to be concerned about how that would add traffic, but they could certainly be bike and pedestrian connections that would make uh, the, the bike and ped, ped trips much more direct. Um, this could remove up to 150,000 vehicle trips per year, uh, but we also think that just making the, the area more bike and ped friendly um, could spur some more um, transit-oriented development on land right around the station. There's an apartment building just to the north uh, that suggests um, that demand for that. Um, uh, so we, um, we think that uh, this could spur more of that. So key findings um, from our study. We found that the data, data visualization and trip quantification are immensely useful. Um, when we initially uh, brought the, the maps to the stakeholders, um, it really started a conversation that I don't think we could have had any other way. Uh, once folks saw where trips were starting and ending and how people were traveling along different corridors, um, it, um, it, it uh, spurred some questions among some of the local stakeholders. Uh, that were more familiar with what was going on there. Um, so we were able to dig into the data a little more and see what we could tell about what was going on. Uh, and as I showed, being able to quantify the number of trips, especially these short trips with the, which don't always show up um, in, in uh, traffic counts and travel demand models, uh, we could quantify the impact of removing just a um, small number of short trips. Uh, we also found that it's um, important to consider multimodal, connect, multimodal connections to the sites as well as at the sites. Um, and this was something that um, showed up in the examples I showed here, but um, also occurred repeatedly, is that we saw that lots of folks were, were using their vehicles throughout the day um, at major employment centers and activity centers, uh, which suggests that the, the area just isn't as friendly as it could be to, to uh, walking and biking. Um, or maybe just uh, mixed-use development so that folks wouldn't have to, to drive um, throughout the day, uh, thus opening up more opportunities for them to, to leave their car at home. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives, um, travel demand man management programs, uh, carpooling programs, um, TDM incentives, um, trying to get folks to commute by other ways. Um, but if they don't feel like they can uh, get around during the day uh, without their car, uh, that would be a major disincentive. And we certainly saw that in the data. That might be um, something for the TDM folks to, to think about. Um, still a lot more work is needed um, in a few areas. Uh, one is um, modal recognition. Um, so we know that these, uh, the trips that we're seeing are vehicle trips. Um, and there's um, questions about being able to identify uh, walking trips and bicycle trips and transit trips. Uh, and there's a couple folks working in the area that are making some gains on this. Um, but it's a tough it's a tough nut to crack. Um, so we're going to be working with some folks to, to see uh, how far we can push this and be able to, to pull out um, pedestrian trips and bike trips and, and transit trips. Trip chaining. Uh, so due to um, concerns about anonym, 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 anonymity, uh, the uh, data is limited to um, individual trips. So we can't necessarily follow uh, an individual throughout the day um, and see um, you know, where they stopped on their way to work, uh, and then where they went to work, and then where they went throughout the day. That's probably a good thing, but it creates some problems um, in terms of understanding people's travel behavior. Um, they may not take the same path uh, in the morning uh, on their way to work as they do in the evening. Um, and we, we saw some signs of that in some of the data. Um, so being able to make more sense of that um, will give us more answers. Uh, automation, so being able to scan the data automatically and uh, identify some of these opportunities, right? So the data isn't going to give you answers. Um, it's basically a tool that you can use. And I think we just scratched the surface in, in terms of finding some of these case studies and understanding what was going on. Uh, and none of it was automatic. So I think there are some, some um, procedures and algorithms that could be put in place to sort of um, automate this process of scanning uh, the region uh, and visualizing the data. Um, there's more to be done in, in producing these maps. Um, and visualizing things like origin destination flows. Um, 
And uh, there's, uh, like I said, there's 17 case studies and a lot more information about the data uh, in the full report, which is um, available at our website. Unmuted. Uh, I think um, we can hand it over to Keith now. Okay, great. Um, while I'm transitioning the um, who's going to be presenting here, I do want to remind anyone listening that you can uh, type in a question into the question box, and we'll be taking those at the end. Just use the little orange arrow in the upper um, right-hand corner if you need to uh, find the question box. So, uh, Keith, I believe you should have control of the slides now and um, you can take it away. Thank you, Robbie, and Muted. thank you, Chris, as well, for your presentation. I certainly would um, start by concurring with your key findings at the end of the study. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk through um, uh, some experiences we have with using the data uh, and some thoughts about um, where this might um, go in the future, particularly from NBTA's perspective. Unmuted. Sorry, you may need to just click on the slide to get control. There you go. Okay. Muted. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so before I, I, I talk through what we, we did with the data, I just wanted to, um, for the benefit of those of you around the country who may not know uh, who we are, um, uh, we, we are a relatively new organization uh, created um, by the General Assembly in, in 2002. Um, but uh, we didn't actually get a dedicated revenue stream until just a few years ago. Um, and I, and, and so working working at MBTA today, it, it feels like a startup uh, business where pretty much everything we're doing, we're, we're doing for the first time. I've been with MBTA for just two years now. Um, so the uh, you can probably barely make out from that map the, uh, the footprint of MBTA, but it covers four counties, uh, five cities, and five towns in the uh, northern Virginia suburbs of the D.C metro region um, and, and essentially um, we're responsible for programming approximately 300 million dollars a year in, um, in, in with a primary focus of reducing congestion through regional project investments um, so our, with our dedicated funding stream um, we really are now forcing ahead to try and develop plan prioritize and fund regional transportation projects in northern Virginia Uh, just very quickly, um, uh, it, for us, it's all about being regional and collaborative and transparent. Um, uh, you probably won't recognize many of these um, uh, uh, kind of shields from the various different um, uh, jurisdictions we partner with, but down the left-hand side, uh, Virginia DOT, VRE, the commuter rail for Northern Virginia, uh, the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, and, and, and uh, Washington Metro as well, so um, it's a very, very broad base, um, and you know we're committed to working uh, to, to to find projects and fund projects that relieve congestion uh, throughout the region. Unfortunately, this region has a reputation for uh, some pretty bad congestion. So, in terms of our um, regional uh, transportation planning activities. Um, uh, we, we've done a couple of plans um, uh, for 2030, which we looked out to 2030 and 2040. Um, both of these plans and their predecessors uh, were done before we had a revenue stream, um, and so the, we're currently working on a, an update to our long-range plan, um, which uh, will be a very, very significant update. And um, the opportunity for some of this big data was. Uh, was just too good to be true when uh, we first heard about this opportunity. So our current uh, transaction um, plan update, transactions is the name we give to our plan, uh, we, we kicked off last year and we're looking to 
for the authority to adopt the plan uh, probably in the fall of next year. Um, so right now we're at the early stages uh, of developing the plan uh, and, 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 and really uh, the opportunity to use this sort of data is hopefully going to prove very uh, valuable for us down the road. Ultimately this plan will, will lead into a six-year program which will uh, likely guide something like uh, $1.7 billion worth of investments in our portfolio of regional transportation solutions in Northern Virginia. And it's very important to understand for us the linkage between our long-range plan and our programming funding activities because we cannot fund anything that's not included in our plan. Um, and even if it's in our plan, that doesn't necessarily mean it will get funded. Uh, we use a very data-driven approach to identify how we uh, choose to use our funding. Um, uh, so you know, data is very important to us. Uh, over the last couple of years since we've got our funding um, uh, in place, we've uh, invested over half a billion dollars in 70 projects. Uh, although you probably can't make out the specifics on the map, the, the red and the, and the blue diamonds uh, represent respectively road and mass transit projects around the region that we've, we've already uh, invested in uh, with our first three years of revenue. Uh, and we're currently engaged in what we're calling our draft FY 2017 program, which is just a one-year program. Uh, again, uh, all, all the projects actually are shown in, in blue uh, on, on this slide. Um, there's 24 candidate projects we're considering with an associated request of $668 million and an estimated $267 million available in our PAYGO or basically our cash revenues. Uh, so clearly we need to make some very uh, smart decisions about how to invest that money um, uh, since there clearly is not enough to go around. So turning to the data, um, uh, first up, a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I want to acknowledge Deputy Secretary Donahue um, uh, from the Commonwealth because I think it was his vision that helped this program get created in the first place uh, and made available to organizations such as us. Unlike the work that Chris described earlier, which I think was really intended on, on the travel demand management agencies, um, uh, while MBTA can fund projects related to that sort of activity, um, we're, we're much more involved in in, in, in that kind of like the heavier infrastructure projects, both highway and transit. And um, and so uh, I, I, when Secretary Donoghue perhaps initiated this program, he didn't necessarily have this in mind, but when we talked about it, it was very clearly, um, from our perspective at least, a, a very good match. Um, so we've used the data um, available, as Chris described earlier, or some of the data that Chris described earlier, to uh, provide us with some kind of background, contextual perspectives um, on the 24 projects that are being considered. So for us, this is really a, a, a true pilot application of using the data uh, to kind of help us understand um, a bit more about the, what the likely effects of our projects will be. Now, our, our process is, is, is much deeper and broader than just this particular set of data, uh, but I think going forward in future years, uh, I can see a very clear role uh, for actually making much stronger use of this information. But this, this, what we used mostly um, was the origin destination information that Chris referred to earlier. Um, and this, um, this, this particular project uh, we're looking at here is along what we call Route 7, this corridor through here. Um, the link we looked at was in here. Um, Chris mentioned Tyson's Corner earlier. That's this area around here. Uh, this piece of highway here is the Capital Beltway. Um, and then the Potomac River goes off in this direction. And, and that's the, the boundary between Northern Virginia and either the District of Columbia or Maryland. Uh, so what you're looking at here is um, uh, eastbound Route 7 uh, in the morning peak with the, the green being the origins and the, the red being the destinations. Um, 
this is a kind of a zoom in. This is the larger picture here off to the left. Um, but it's the, the same the same data for the same time period. Um, and, and what we're able to see from this is that a you know, significantly high proportion of the traffic using this particular segment here is going to finish the trip in the Tyson's Corner area. Uh, and also a, a slightly smaller amount of traffic is going to finish across the river, probably see it better on this half of the slide, in the district or in, in Maryland. And really beyond that, apart from a few little pockets of um, destinations around the Capital Beltway, um, you know, m most of the traffic isn't uh, on this link isn't getting very far beyond either Tyson's or jumping onto the Beltway to go across the river or, or possibly through here to get across to the river. So um, th this was kind of important information for us to kind of understand uh, how this this particular segment is performing in a regional context. And if you look at the green areas, again, you can see a lot of the uh, that the origins are in the kind of the close in, closer in suburbs. Uh, and again, you can see in a bit more detail over here as well. Um, so again, as, as Chris mentioned earlier, that, that you know, in, in many cases we're seeing um, uh, travel patterns which um, are, are, are not involving very large distances. These are these are quite um, targeted um, uh, use of this link. So that really helped us kind of understand uh, what was going on. Now this is based on the top hundred origin destination pairs. Uh, which accounted for about 40% of the total trips um, one way on this link during that three-hour time period, uh, just under 8,000 um, vehicle movements in total. And you can also see some kind of what on the face of it looked like uh, slightly weird things going on with traffic moving in this direction, uh, ending up over here in Maryland and also back here in, in, in the western part of the region. And uh, while on the face of it that looks a bit weird, in, in reality it's not. Where you understand that uh, to cross the Potomac River, you've either got to cross it here uh, or way up here. So people in this area here are, are obviously just coming down and looping back to go across into Maryland. Uh, and also from this point here, there are ways to loop down kind of on local back roads almost to get back to this area over here. Otherwise, people want to go further that way would be on the westbound side of the road. So, um, uh, pretty information, pretty interesting to see that sort of thing being played out using this data. Um, I mentioned the transaction update earlier. We haven't used the data yet um, uh, for uh, our long-range plan update, but it, it and it's quite clear to me as project manager for that effort that the origin destination information we've already used um, will, will be potentially be very helpful. Understanding the travel behavior in and between activity centers, uh, Chris referred to these as, as case studies. Um, in, in, in Northern Virginia, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big push for uh, future uh, employment uh, and, and residential development to be concentrated in, in regional activity centers. Uh, and so understanding the pattern of travel behavior in and between those centers is, is going to be increasingly important to us. And it, it would appear that the, 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 the big data we're talking about here has, has some great potential applications for us. Uh, a model validation, I've, a question like this, I'm not really sure whether this would happen in, in practice, but um, uh, certainly the potential appears to be there to to, to look at um, you know, if there are validation issues with the model to use the data to kind of understand a little bit more uh, what might be going on if that helps. Um, we basically use the regional travel demand model uh, in, in this area which uh, obviously is, is, is reasonably well validated but because we actually then take the, the data from the regional travel demand model and, and feed that into the Transims model um, you know, we, we kind of need to go through a revalidation process. So that's where this may come in useful. I also would think that over the, the course of the next uh, five to ten years, uh, it will be interesting to see um, how we can tie this in with potentially using data from transportation network companies. Uh, Uber and Lyft have a very strong profile in this region uh, and indeed have offered to share their data with us. So. Uh, it, it'd be interesting to see if we can mesh those things together. Um, 
further down the road, um, one of the things which um, uh, we have to do as part of the legislation that um, uh, established our revenue stream is that we have to um, get a very clear understanding of the, of the, uh, the regional transportation impact of projects that we fund with our regional revenues um, because essentially these are the tax revenues and, and the legislation requires us to ensure that there is some benefit that goes back to the jurisdictions from which the revenue um, was generated in the first place. Um, we've established some guidelines uh, to, to, to go about doing that, um, but we haven't actually done this in practice yet. We probably won't do it in practice for maybe another five to seven years. Um, but part of the process for allocating long-term benefit or ensuring that long-term benefit is allocated within the intent of the law is going to be based on an understanding of the residence, the residency of any users of any facilities that uh, receive MBTA funding. So again, this sort of data would seem to offer us the prospect of understanding who's actually using the facilities that we've funded and, and that are operational. Uh, so I'm quite excited that this data came along after we established our guidelines. Um, and a key part of our guidelines was that um, we wouldn't tie ourselves in and, uh, to a methodology and a, and a technology and modeling approach uh, until the time we had to do it, um, recognizing that uh, big data would likely advance in leaps and bounds beyond what we can even imagine today. And, and, and so we didn't want to tie our hands with a methodology which forced us to use old um, old data or old technology. So uh, I'm quite excited that um, this sort of data will be helpful to us for applying this legal requirement that is imposed on MBTA. I think with that, I'll probably um, finish. Uh, some contact information. Unmuted. Uh, the authority and also for transaction, our long range uh, plan has a separate website. So, uh, Robbie, I'll hand it back to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see how the this project uh, translates into um, action or how the data can be used in, in Virginia. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in. I do want to remind people that if you do have questions, um, you can t type them into the chat box, and um, we will have the, a recording of this webinar up uh, probably by tomorrow morning. So um, I'm going to leave up Keith's uh, uh, contact information for a little while, but I'm going to let my colleague, uh, Mary Ebeling, who's been looking at the questions, uh, and scrolling through those. I'm going to let her go ahead and ask those. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited that y'all were able to come and listen to this um, great presentation. I'll start with a question that came in early, and I think it's a good one. Uh, what are the sources or source of information for the GPS data that was used? And I'll let uh, yeah, direct anyone. Yeah, so um, obviously I can't speak specifically because a lot of that um, is on the internal end of, of what goes on at Streetlight Data. Um, but it, it comes largely from uh, any um, navigational or app device that has GPS location enabled. So a lot of it is actually um, cars that are uh, being built with, with location device, GPS devices built in now, um, which is becoming much more common. Um, and that's, I think, the biggest chunk of where things are coming from. And then specific apps. Um, that have geo GPS location uh, built in. Um, so not the, the cell phone location from the cell phone towers, but in the same way that um, Google might know your, your location based on GPS in your phone, right? Um, obviously, it's not coming from Google, um, but other apps have a GPS location turned on. Um, so uh, the, the provider is, is um, uh, making arrangements with various um, uh, folks that have this GPS location uh, and and folding it into into their um, into their their data and and screening it all um, and aggregating it and filtering it um, and and everything uh, that goes into to putting it all into one one big data set. All right. Well, um, 
that seems like it's fairly uh, complicated and labor intensive. Do you, um, do you have any uh, information on how uh, what the pricing scheme looks like and what the turnaround time is to get the data? Um, <clears throat> so they uh, so uh, this particular provider has um, all of the data national data and maybe international, I, I couldn't say. But um, they have the archive going back to whenever they first started collecting data. So it's a couple years now. Um, and I know that their, their data is getting larger and larger. Um, so it's already there in-house. Um, so what you would do if you were doing, let's say you were doing a corridor study, um, you would have to provide a, a zone system, right? So we showed um, where the zones where we're interested in seeing origin and destination flows. Uh, you would have to come up with a zone system, and that's how the pricing would be based. So you could come up with, let's say, your your ar arrangement said that you could have 100 zones. Um, that's how you'd be limited. Um, and then you'd also set up like um, select links, like we mentioned, uh, along certain routes that you're inter interested in, um, and uh, those would count as zones too. So your your contract with them would basically be the, limited by the number of zones. Uh, and then you um, uh, provide them with shape files, um, tell them exactly what time periods are in, what types of vehicles, and all that. Um, and the turnaround is pretty quick. Um, I can't speak to the exact price, but uh, you know the other the other ways of, that have been ways of doing this in the past have been. Um, I know it's you could set up Bluetooth sensors. Um, this has been done here in Wisconsin a bit, setting up Bluetooth sensors. Uh, then again, those only tell you where folks are passing certain points, so you can't follow them through the whole trip. Uh, or you could do uh, aerial studies with um, aerial photography uh, and videography. Um, and uh, those are also uh, much more expensive. So I think in terms of where technology is going, this is, this is the, the, in many cases, going to be the, the cheaper alternative. So it's, it's really exciting to see. All right. Um, we also have Seth Golub on the line. Um, and uh, since he's been working with you, I, I just decided to unmute him so he can jump in and, and help. Um, at any point, if that seems um, something worth doing, um, let's see. Yeah, and sure. By the way, Chris did a great job of answering questions, um, but uh, happy to provide more details if there's more interest in things like sources and um, turnaround time. Seth is from Streetlight Data, who was providing the the actual GPS information from us, so to us. Um, I have one more question here, um, if we have time. Uh, this has to do um, back with back to modal recognition. Some of the challenges of being able to identify bicycle and pedestrian trips. I know that in many ways we just don't have the numbers uh, for these trips. But uh, does anybody want to address the specific challenges for how you get that coverage of, of non-motorized? transportation trips? Um, well, it might be something that Seth would want to touch on, but I'll just say that it basically comes down to, to, to coming up with rules of thumb to be able to identify a certain type of trip. So you would, for a pedestrian trip, you would need to say that, you know, it never goes above a certain speed or, or things like that. Um, the problem is uh, knowing how to, to actually calibrate those numbers is a big part of the problem. So if you thought you had a way of recognizing pedestrian trips, for example, um, you would need some data to calibrate that against. Um, so we're, we're actually uh, working on a project in, in Sacramento, again with the streetlight data, um, to try and uh, get some, some pedestrian, bike and pedestrian counts, or maybe pedestrian counts only, um, and see um, how good we can recognize some of those trips. So we'll know more about that really soon. Um, and I don't know if Seth wants to add anything. Yeah, um, I think Chris uh, did a good overview. Um, so as Chris had mentioned, one of the large and very fast-growing sources of data, um, of GPS data, is smartphone handsets, um, including um, app, uh, data coming from certain applications, but also from certain um, handset manufacturers with very large market shares. And, and as Chris had mentioned, you can use heuristics to filter out um, you know, pedestrian trips. You can look at um, trip length, uh, maximum speed. You can take a look at whether they're departing the actual road network and cutting through. And with that, um, you can actually isolate um, with high confidence um, trips that are that are pedestrian and um, to a certain lesser extent uh, bicycle as well too. And so as Chris mentioned, what we're 
doing is doing a project um, in Sacramento looking at this and the application is looking at um, pedestrian uh, travel patterns in and around transit um, park and ride locations um, and we will be learning a lot more uh, over the next few months uh, so this is the sort of stuff that would be available in summer and also as Chris mentioned um, or perhaps it was the person who asked the questions the sample counts for this tend to be lower so um, a lot of the value in the information may also be on the qualitative side. So while it may be harder to calibrate um, to say this percent of trips are pedestrian only, um, you should be able to do a good job of understanding where are people currently um, walking to and from, say, a transit station, and what route are they taking, and even um, from a safety perspective, do we see issues where it looks like people are cutting across, uh, you know, unsafe streets. So those are the sort of things that we're going to look to understand more over the next couple months. Thank you very much, Seth. Um, sure. There's a lot of Robbie, I think you're muted. Oh, oh yeah, you are. Sorry, Robbie. Um, <laughs> Thank you. That's my fault. Um, I've got it. I got it. So um, I think there's a lot of interest in in using this for both uh, pedestrian and bicycle, and maybe even uh, routes to transit, and just seeing how this data can be used in many different ways. I think this is very interesting, and we're really looking forward to um, to using it in more ways. Uh, we don't have any further questions on this webinar, but I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. And a reminder that we will have a recording of the webinar up on the website tomorrow. And if you would like to find out about future webinars or subscribe to our newsletter, you can do that on our website, which is ssti.us. And you can also follow us on Twitter, uh, SmartTransp. Uh, you can sign up for to follow us on Twitter on our website as well. So uh, please let us know if you have any future questions. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you to our presenters very much. It was, uh, it was very interesting. Thanks.